are blessed, filled with the Holy Spirit. How my soul praises the Lord. I am the Lord's servant. And you will name him Jesus, the Son of the Most High. Hi church, I hope you're all doing well. Let's sing this song as we prepare our hearts for worship. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flow Your 
glory, God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God is what our
This next song is written as like a love song to to us from God. So let's sing this song together. I'm standing at your door. My heart is calling yours. Come fall into my arms.
Luke chapter 1 verses 57 to 80 The birth of John the Baptist When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah, after his father. But Elizabeth said, No, his name is John. What? they exclaimed. There's no one in all your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, His name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. All fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant, David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in the holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell His people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. John grew up and became strong in the spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Hi Hillside family, we are one week away from Christmas. Merry early Christmas. Now whether I would see you at a straight ski Christmas celebration or the Christmas service next week, I cannot wait to see you finally in person. I look forward worshipping together with you as a church family. Now on a personal note, on behalf of Max and I, we'd like to thank you for sharing the joy of our wedding ceremony last month. And we are so, so honoured and so touched by your love, prayers and blessings. And it was such a joyous day for us because we get to celebrate it with you on site and online. And thank you, Hillside family, for being part of our special day. Now after our wedding, people have been telling us, you know wedding celebration over already. So the next celebration is birth of a new baby. When are we seeing little Max and little Alicia? Continue the joy. I want to see and hold your baby. We want to share the joy of a newborn baby. Well, to that, I will say, well, this, for us, there's no plans yet to have a baby anytime soon. But the passage today greets us with a similar joy and celebration and probably even more because Elizabeth has given birth to a son and her husband, Zechariah, he is still unable to speak. Now, why is Zechariah unable to speak in the beginning of the passage? Well, if you read in the first part of Luke chapter 1, you will know that Zechariah, he could not speak for nine months because of his disbelief. Now, one day when he was serving the Lord in the temple, an angel appeared to Zechariah and said, Elizabeth will bear you a son, and his name is to be John, and his life calling, his life mission, his task is to prepare the way for the Lord. Now this is great news because finally, Zechariah and Elizabeth would have a child of their own. Now they've been trying and praying and praying and trying to have a child. 
And maybe you know someone is experiencing that or maybe you've experienced this before or even now that you've been trying and praying for a child. You've been trying and praying for a family member to know, to come to know Christ and you've been trying and praying for healing. Have you experienced that before? That you've been trying and praying and God seems silent about our prayers. And God seems silent about Zechariah's prayers and deepest desire to have a child until this glorious encounter with the angel happened. Now, you know, Zechariah's name means God remembers. And in this moment with the angel, it seems that God has not forgotten him and his wife Elizabeth. And it seems that God finally remembered their prayers and their faithfulness to him and now God is answering their prayer for a child and this is great news and Zechariah can you guess how did he react to this great news I mean if if it were to be you how would you react you would say yay I'm gonna be a father I'm gonna post this on Instagram right but Zechariah he didn't really react it that way in fact he messed it up when God is finally blessing him and Elizabeth with a child, he said this, How can I be sure of this would happen? I mean, Elizabeth and I are so old, we could be part of the museum's display. That's how old we are. It's impossible for us to have a child now. And Zechariah's disbelief came with a consequence. He could no longer speak. And the angel told him, you will remain muted. You will lose your voice until all that I said takes place in God's time. That's your consequence for having this disbelief. So fast forward, the son is now born and it has been eight days since Elizabeth has given birth. And today is the circumcision ceremony for the son. Now, what is circumcision? Circumcision is a small operation done on all Israelite baby boys and it serves as a sign that this Israelite baby boy belongs to God. So it's a huge celebration. Even our wedding celebration also gala, okay? Confirm families, friends, cousins, uncles, cousins, neighbors, neighbors, cousins all came to share the joy of Zechariah and Elizabeth because God has been merciful to them to bless them with a son even at such an old age. So there was food, there was noise, there was people bringing more food and more noise. It is a disaster for introverts if they were to be there because everyone wants to see the child. Everyone wants to hold the child. Everyone is starting to call the son, little Zachariah. Oh, little Zachariah. Oh, how God remembers you, little child. But Elizabeth, in obedience to the word of the angel, she voiced out and said, no, his name is to be John. And the people were shocked. And they said to Elizabeth, they call me auntie. No one in your relatives has that name. Now in those days, it is their customs to name after their father or relative's name. And so they said to Elizabeth, Tim Tak, Elizabeth cannot la. Where God suddenly named him a John one? No such things. Ah yeah, you probably didn't rest enough like Elizabeth, okay? I, we, we know you're very tired, okay? We do you a favor. You rest, we go ask Zechariah for you, okay? We will take over from here. So they turned to Zechariah and then they, they were doing hand gestures like baby, name Zechariah, right? Zechariah, Zechariah. I mean like Zechariah couldn't speak, it doesn't, doesn't mean that he couldn't hear but somehow probably we do that when we think someone couldn't speak that means he couldn't hear but, but that's what they do, it's like Zechariah, your son, name, what name? Zechariah, right? And Zechariah just motioned for a paper and pen. And in his obedience to God, he remembered what the angel said, that he would be named John. And so he did. He obeyed the Lord and he wrote, his name is John. And everyone was shocked. Everyone was surprised. And just when they thought that was the only surprise they are getting, the next surprise happened instantly. The second Zechariah finished writing the name, his name is John, immediately his voice came back. His name is John. Wait, 
I could speak again. My voice came back. As soon as I named my son John, I could speak again. God has opened my mouth and Zechariah praised God. I can speak, I can speak, I can now speak. I can bless my God with my words. And Zechariah praised God and wrote a whole song after that. And all that came to that celebration that day, families, friends, relatives, cousins, neighbors, were in awe of what just happened. Because they were witnessing miracle after miracle. They were holding a miracle baby boy in their arms. And Zechariah miraculously could speak again. And if you study Luke chapter 1, every time after God fulfills something or do something, you find that there's a pattern of joy and gladness and rejoicing and singing. And I'll talk more about that after this. But I want to sit on the topic of joy and Christmas. Now, Christmas is a joyous time. And what is your favorite part of Christmas? I know one of the many reasons why I like Christmas is that somehow during Christmas, everyone seems happier. Probably because it's the end of the year and the kids are on holidays and you're clearing your year-end leaves, spending time with family, and then there's pretty Christmas lights and decoration and there's just so much delight and rejoicing and singing, the Christmas carols, of course. But for you and I as followers of Jesus, this joy has a deeper sense of meaning every time during Christmas. Or someone would phrase it, Christian joy. Why Christian joy? Joy is joy, la. what Christian joy? Well, the joy that we have as Christians is that the joy that Luke is writing about in this gospel, the joy that Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary experience, the joy that you and I have as Christians, it continues to fill our hearts even after Christmas tree is taken down and the gifts are all open, even after the decorations and the pretty lights are taken down, and the kids are back to school and we're back to work. But our joy continues. So what is this joy? What can we learn about joy from Luke chapter 1 specifically? So the first one is this. Joy is simply being aware of God's presence in our life. Now, I mentioned just now that every time after God fulfills or do something in Luke chapter 1, there is this picture of singing and rejoicing and delight. Now, let me point it out to you here. So the first one is the birth of John foretold. The angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and said, Your son will be a joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And the second one is when Mary visited Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was so excited, and so was the baby in her womb, so much that the baby in my womb jumped for joy. And the third one is Mary spoke of her joy in her song of praise. Mary praised God. She said, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then we came to today's passage, huge rejoicing and celebration over the birth of John the Baptist. And says here, when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. And then finally, Zechariah, in his obedience to God, he named his son John. As soon as that happened, he could speak again, and he wrote a song of praise to God. And he prophesied. So there is a pattern here. Every time God's presence is there, every time God fulfills a promise, the people's response is joy and rejoicing and gladness. And what is joy? Joy is simply means that we recognize and we are aware that God is in the room, that God's presence is with us. Now, joy doesn't mean the absence of problems and inconvenience. I mean, there's nothing convenient about bearing a child by a very old lady, Elizabeth. And there'll be tons of problems when people find out Mary is pregnant before she married Joseph. So joy is not the absence of problems or inconvenience or the absence of wrong Christmas baking recipe or your children fighting for bigger Christmas gifts or burnt Christmas food or late shipping from Shopee. But even in the midst of all the chaos, 
We can have joy. I can have joy. You can have joy because we know that God's presence is still with me. That God's presence is still with you in the calm and in the storm, in the peace and in the chaos, the ups and downs. We can have joy because we have God's presence in us and with us. Amen. So the question today now for us is this: Are you aware? Of God's presence in your life today, when you go about your day, are you aware of God's presence? You know, I was told that marriage is like a mirror; it makes you see yourself more clearly, the good and also the bad. And from time to time, Max would ask me, "You know, are you aware of this bad habit of yours, or are you aware that you look kind of fierce when you're working?" Oh, I hope I didn't scare anyone. And of course, the nice things as well. Okay, he would say, "Oh, are you aware that you were actually very kind just now to that person right there?" And Max would tell it to me, and simply just a nudge and just a reminder. You know, are you aware? Are you aware? So today, this is a nudge. This is a reminder. Are you aware of God's presence in your life today? Are you aware as you prepare for Christmas, the cooking, the baking, the gift wrapping, family reunions, so much going on, and so much potential chaos, right? But you and I can still have joy because joy is simply being aware of God's presence in our lives, and there's so much comfort and strength that we could receive by simply telling ourselves, "God, your presence is with me." Help me to be aware. So the question today is: Are you aware of God's presence in your life today? So the second thing is this: that we can learn about joy is that joy is remembering our salvation story. Joy is remembering our salvation story. You know, whenever we share praise reports or we give thanks to God on what happened in our week, or even in our quiet time as we offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God, sometimes we forgot to give thanks that Christ came, died on the cross, and saved us from our sins. And now we have the power and freedom to say no to sin and live for God. Now, please don't get me wrong. It's not. It's not that from. Now on, all that we give thanks to God is the cross of how Christ has saved us from our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the cross, and we don't give thanks to anything else. No, okay, because we know that all good and perfect gift comes from above, and of course, we are to give thanks as well. But I am saying that sometimes I myself got too familiar with the fact that yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, Christ came. He died on the cross for me, and He saved me from my sins, and. Sometimes I got familiar, you know. We we got familiar. Then there's not much praise and rejoicing and joy about. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. But if you look into Zechariah's life, his first words of praise were not even about his newborn son, but about the coming Savior. You know, he was saying, "Finally, God would do what He promised since Abraham's time, since David's time, and I get to witness it. God will save and redeem Israel." I mean, look at Zechariah verse sixty-eight. He said this: "Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because He has visited and redeemed His people, and now we will be saved from our enemies in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live, because." God is fulfilling His promise of sending our long-awaited mighty Savior. The Messiah is coming, and He will save us from our enemies. And there's so much joy and gladness and expectations in Zechariah. And what about us today? When was the last time that our hearts were filled with so much thanksgiving and joy for our Savior, that Christ has come to save us, that even if there's nothing that I could be happy about in a long and chaotic day, and even if I could feel like this year Christmas is so hectic, so lonely, or so worrisome, so troublesome, that I can still find joy with the truth that Christ has come for you and for me, and He has saved me. From my imperfections, from my mistakes, from my struggles, my addiction, my depression, my loneliness—that even if everything in my life doesn't seem to be doing well, 
I can still find joy by remembering my salvation story. When was the last time you shared your salvation story to others? And when was the last time you recalled on how God drawn you to his love, your first love? What is your salvation story? Was it when you were in a deep, dark place and God reached out to you through someone? Or was it when you were growing up in a Christian family and you understood the love of God here? And then slowly but surely, one day you understood the love of God here. When was the last time you sit and reflect and thank God that he has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light? I know for me it was not very recent. I know for me I would forget sometimes to give thanks about that. And I needed worship songs to remind me. I needed prayers and fellowship and serving with people to remind me. And I needed his word to remind me. I needed the preaching of the word to remind me. I needed reminders. And my prayer is that we never get too familiar, that we never get bored of being reminded, that Hillside family, we never get bored to be reminded that Christ came for us and saved us from our greatest enemy of sin and death even more so this Christmas. So what is joy or Christian joy, if you like? Number one, joy is simply being aware of God's presence in our lives. And number two, joy is remembering our salvation in Christ. And finally, the third thing that we can learn from our passage today is this. Joyful obedience to God is a daily decision. You know, I love Zechariah's story. And even though he was disciplined by God for his disbelief, he couldn't speak for nine whole months. But what was supposed to be a discipline from God has become a gift to Zechariah's growth in the Lord. He's a different person after that nine months of silence. Well, someone put it this way. The old priest's last word had been one of doubt. His first word now was one of delight. Then he wanted a sign, and now he wanted to sing. Zechariah's last word had been one of doubt. It's impossible for us to have a child at our age. But his first word now after nine months of silence was one of delight. Praise God, I can now worship God with my words. I can finally speak. And previously, Zechariah had wanted a sign. How can I be sure that I would have a son? And now he wanted to sing and he wrote a song, he prophesied and he worshipped God. The Zechariah at the end of Luke chapter 1 is a different person. He is joyfully praising God and he is quick to obey God now. There was no sense of doubt to name his son John because that's what the angel had told him to do. And it wasn't just Zechariah, his wife Elizabeth too. Now, despite being a woman back then, she voiced out in obedience to God, no, he is not Zechariah, his name is to be John. And she was firm, and Zechariah was firm on that. And Zechariah's joy and obedience didn't stop after naming his son John. I mean, look at the final part of the passage. After declaring and singing about Jesus redeeming and saving Israel, he turned his attention to his precious little son. In verse 76, he said, that you, my little son, my only son, my answered prayer, my deepest desire, so many things that I can do with you as father and son. But Zechariah was reminded that it's no longer what I want for my son. Because God was clear to me that John, my son, is to be a prophet of the Most High because he will prepare the way for the Lord. And no longer it's about my dreams for my own son, but it's about being obedient to God. And with Elizabeth, they brought up John according to God's ways. How do I know that they did that? Well, in verse 80, John grew up and became strong in spirit. The angel told them that John should never touch alcohol. And it takes obedience for the parents to bring up their son in God's ways. 
and John lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Now, Zechariah is a priest, not a prophet. And John living in the wilderness is not what priests are familiar with about serving God. But Zechariah and Elizabeth joyfully, confidently obeyed the Lord. And that is a daily parental decision of joyfully obeying God. That I may not understand how and why, but I know that this child is given from God and I will joyfully obey the Lord in bringing my child in God's ways. So how is this related to us today? Well, it has everything to do with our walk with God today. Joyful obedience is not an attitude of like, okay, la, I don't want to do this, but since I'm obeying you, God, I will do it. Okay, no, but you don't see that in Zechariah and Elizabeth. There's such readiness to obey God, so much joy, so much expectations. And what about us today? No joyful obedience doesn't mean we are to suddenly do big and awesome and great things. And sometimes, and most of the time, obedience happens in the smallest ways. For example, children, honor your parents. Okay, I'll, I'll wash the dishes tonight even before my parents ask me to do it. Husbands, love your wife. I probably should help my wife with some chores after this. Wives, submit to your husbands. Mm, I probably should be more open to his Christmas plans for our family this year. No obedience could be sending an apology message after this. Or to be a little bit more patient when a food order is running slightly late. Or as simple as actually look into the eyes of the waiter and say thank you when the food arrives at your table. And if we're honest, we don't get it right every day, don't we? I mean, even though joyful obedience to God is a daily decision, we don't get it right every day. Yesterday, I was talking patiently with my husband. Today, I raised my voice to him. Yesterday, I studied my Bible and, and it says that I am to be kind to one another. And today, I was far from kind for my colleague. We don't get it right every time. And I'll give you an example of how I myself don't get it right every time. You know, when I was writing the sermon itself, my attitude wasn't exactly joyful obedience. It's more like, I'll do it, Lord, because you've given it to me. But joyfully obey you? Not exactly. I mean, I myself struggle to live out what I'm preaching today while preparing to preach on joyful obedience. Now, I hope that comforts you that we don't get it right every day. So what did I do? Well, I needed to literally verbalize my words out and tell myself, as I prepare this sermon, that God, your presence is with me. Help me be aware. Give me joy. And I had to verbally tell myself, God, you have saved me from my sins. You have given me the Holy Spirit. I can seek your wisdom. Remind me again. Give me joy. God, you have called me to serve you. You have given me a task. You have given me a calling. Help me to obey you joyfully. And probably that's you today. You know and you know that God is telling you to do something that requires obedience from you, making that tough phone call, sending that apology message, or rescheduling something in your appointment to reprioritize God and His work. And you needed a verbal reminder from yourself to yourself, help me to obey you joyfully, Lord. God, I lean into your help. I lean into your strength. Help me to readily and joyfully obey you. Now, Christmas is a joyous time. Celebrations are great gifts from God to us. But let's not forget also the joy in obeying the Lord. Let there be readiness, expectations, and joy in our hearts as we obey Him daily. I want to pray for all of us right now. And with our hearts open to hear from God and ask Lord, Lord, is there anything that you are calling me to do today? 
that require joyful obedience from my side. Probably it's a phone call or it's an act of kindness to someone. Probably it's my attitude towards work or my family. Let's seek the Lord now and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, to strengthen us, to choose to joyfully obey the Lord today. And with our eyes continue closed, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. God, your presence is with me. Help me to be aware. Give me joy. God, you have saved me from my sins. I have no fear and lack. Remind me again. Give me joy. God, you have given this life to me so that I can live for you. Help me to obey you joyfully. In Jesus' name, Amen. What a great reminder. Joy comes from being fully aware that we are in God's presence. Number two, joy is remembering our salvation story. Jesus came to seek and to save us. Amen. And that's the greatest joy in our life. And number three, joyful obedience to God is a daily decision. Thank you, Pastor Alicia, for delivering God's words to us today. And may you find and experience real joy this Christmas. Now, church, brothers and sisters, I have good news for you. Now, we are just one week away from Christmas Day. Now, we have invited a special guest, a shepherd, to bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. Also, we have special presentation and gifts for everyone. So be sure to invite your friends, your family, your neighbours and co-workers. Now, there was a survey taken and 80% of the people surveyed revealed that they would most likely attend if they were just invited. So 80% is huge. So start praying and thinking about who do you need to invite. So bring someone to church this Christmas. Now remember to pre-register through the Google form and I have reserved seat for everyone. So I look forward to celebrating Christmas with you and your family on 25th December, which is a Saturday, 10.30 a.m. So right now, uh, let us pray and I want us to pray uh, with the three P, praise, people and personal. So let's pray together, okay? Pray with me. Oh, Father, Lord, we want to praise you for your great and awesome plan. Thank you for bringing good news and great joy to the whole world. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let us receive her King. Thank you, God, for sending your Son, Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, to save us. We want to pray for people who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus yet. So church, brothers and sisters, I want you to think of one person right now who needs Jesus. And I want you to pray for him or her. Lord, I pray that they would come to know the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior this Christmas. And finally, let us pray for ourselves. Let me ask you, are you ready to shine for Jesus this Christmas? Are you ready to serve Jesus? Be the hands and the feet of Jesus. It simply means communicating the love of Christ to everyone you meet. Lord, I pray that you would create opportunity for us to share the good news of Jesus, to share our salvation stories, or even demonstrate God's love to someone this Christmas. Lord, use us to touch someone's life. And may we all find joy in serving Jesus. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. And everybody say, Amen. Thank you for joining us this week. And may God's richest blessings continue to be with you all as we serve Jesus Christ together. Have a blessed weekend and I see you on Christmas Day.